So let me tell you a bit about our research that we've been working on. Um, the, the BCAJ, is, as we've, uh, we have a very sort of bold and aggressive research plan. And over the past year, we've been doing a lot of work. So there's sort of eight or seven large areas. We've been working on legislative prayer, taxes, crisis pregnancy centers, invocations. We've been doing sort of the spot research, which is sort of issues arising research. We've looked at medical assistance in dying, and we've looked at conversion therapy. And we've also been contributing to court cases. So I'm not including our, our legal stuff um, in this part of the conversation because I'm not involved in that and uh, would do a bad job explaining it. So I'll take you on a quick rapid adventure through those, those research projects. I'm not gonna go into in depth on in all of them. We've given talks on a lot of this research and I see some, some folks who have attended those. Um, but when it comes to legislative prayer, as Ian mentioned a few years ago, we created a data set of prayer in the BC legislature. And we've been publishing off of that and doing research on that area um, since then. And this year we had four major publications come out on legislative prayer. We had a report that we looked at um, called Decolonizing Prayer, which looked at indigenous content in the BC legislature. They don't start daily sessions with a, a territorial acknowledgement, but they do start it with a prayer. So we worked on, on a detailed report on that. I think it's quite still quite topical given the conversations we're having around reconciliation today. It still shocks me that we wouldn't start with a territorial acknowledgement, but we would start with a prayer. Um, that, and that built on our previous work. We had um, a smaller report come out on legislative prayer across Canada. And that was sort of a handout that gives people just information about the different practices in, in legislatures across the country. There's considerable diversity from Newfoundland and Labrador, and, and which has no prayer or never has, Quebec, which canceled it, to uh, the Lord's Prayer opening a number of legislatures. And we made that as sort of an accessible sort of worksheet with lots of good detailed research in it uh, for folks to look at. Um, and then we did a, a larger piece, um, which is, oh, and Ian and I had an article come out called Arb Arbiters of Faith, which was in a peer reviewed journal. And that really looks at that issue that I kind of mentioned uh, to Murr's question, which explores, you know, can the state actually decide what is a religion without violating its duty of religious neutrality? And the answer is no. Um, and so when the, we had a big win this year, I guess it's still within this year, um, the BC legislature changed its practices around legislative prayer from prayers to prayers and reflections, which is a tiny change. Um, we're, and we're still running uh, some quantitative analysis to determine the effect of that. I'm presenting a paper on that um, at a conference in a few weeks. Uh, but uh, the state really in, embroils itself in, in religious dogma in a way it's not appropriate when it tries to decide what is prayer, when it tries to decide what is a religion, and when it tries to decide um, you know, a list of sample prayers to include, include in our legislature. And then um, we've been looking at municipal prayer. And so the idea behind the Saguenay case, um, which is a, a really important Supreme Court decision that, that rules that we have to have separation of religion and government, specifically the state has a duty of religious neutrality in Canada. And you've all, many of you have heard me talk about this before. We looked at municipalities across the province and found ones that were opening their inaugural sessions with prayer, we wrote to a lot of them. Many of them have changed their practices, which is which reassuring. And we released a report called The Duty of Neutrality Beyond Saguenay. And so that's that's one project we did in BC. And, and I'll talk in a second about how we've expanded that project. We do have two forthcoming publications, which are causing me stress because they're not coming out quickly enough. Um, but one of them is uh, a summary of our broader House of Prayers report, looking at prayer in the BC legislature. And that's going to be coming out in the Canadian Parliamentary Review at some random point in the future. They don't seem very rushed on releasing it, but that's okay. Uh, there's been a pandemic on and lots of other pressing issues. And then the other one is a book chapter in an edited academic book uh, called Change in Prayer. And that is a... Uh, a book chapter that looks at how prayer has changed in the BC legislature as a result of it being renamed from prayers to prayers and reflections. So the great thing about the research that we've been doing is we have this data set, we're able to build it and we're able to query it. Uh, I was just talking to Katie the other day about you know, how we can actually look at gender and how gender affects religiosity of prayer in the BC legislature. And no one's ever done that before. It's groundbreaking stuff. And it, it can provide lots of other insights um, apart from our use of that research in our advocacy work. So we've been expanding and we have very ambitious plans for our legislative prayer work. So um, we, as, um, as I mentioned, Adriana has been looking over the municipal, municipal minutes and, and agendas of every municipality in the country with a population of over a thousand, that is several thousand municipalities. And we'll be preparing reports looking at legislative prayer in municipal government in Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario, Manitoba, the Maritimes. Uh, we might 
look at Quebec and the North, although because the, the data isn't really giving us much to talk about there, we'll probably include that in our final larger article. Uh, those will each be reports which we're going to give to our friends or share with our friends in those provinces so that um, other humanist organizations and atheist groups in those provinces can use that research to achieve ideally outcomes. And the outcome we're looking for is compliance with the Supreme Court and the Constitution of Canada. Doesn't seem like a very big ask. Um, and so we're going to be releasing those reports in the coming months and year. Uh, and we got a lot of them. And there's a lot of really interesting uh, aspects around legislative prayer that we've been exploring, like stealth prayer. So it, maybe it's not the Lord's prayer, but it looks like a prayer. It sort of smells like a prayer, but it's not quite a prayer. And we're kind of exploring the nuance of what is, what is, is legislative prayer. We're going to be compiling all that into one large academic article that summarizes the results for the whole country. And um, Adrian is presenting on that at a conference later in the month. And it's going to be sort of an overview of, okay, so we have a Supreme Court ruling. You know, we do a lot of work in the courts trying to fight for, for change and support secular you know, issues and separation of religion and government. But if those court rulings aren't followed, then we have a problem. So we're really looking to see how, how bold um, how bold and how enforced Sagan, the Saguenay decision is. And we're going to monitor things in BC. So we did have a bunch of sort of recalcitrant municipalities here in BC that uh, dug in their heels or seemed to indicate that they didn't quite care about the constitution or separation of religion and government. Um, and so we're going to keep an eye on them when it comes to municipal elections here in BC, 492 days away in, uh, in 2022. Um, and we're going to be keeping a rough eye on them. I think I got my math right. I may have been off by a few days. <laughs> So that's our, our, our municipal prayer research. And just to quickly summarize our, our tax research. So as Adrian already mentioned, we are releasing a report on the clergy, clergy residency exemptions very, very soon. I'm just finishing editing on my desk and it's going to go through some, some a few more back and forths. Um, and we have a multi-stage uh, approach to dealing with tax exemptions. So this is kind of in response to the question we had earlier. So we released in September... Uh, 2020, 2020 um, a report called In the Public Benefit. And this was a briefing note, and we sent it to every single municipal councillor in the province as part of our lobbying efforts around the Union of British Columbia Municipalities meeting, um, where all the municipalities get together and decide what they want to ask the province to do. And one of the things we were asking them to do was to change the statutory and permissive tax exemption rules, which allow places of worship to automatically get tax exemptions, millions of dollars in tax exemptions without ever trying or demonstrating that they have a benefit to the public. So that report came out. It was a very factual report. It was a briefing paper and it accompanied lobbying efforts. In February 2021, we released a second step in that process, which was um, a public good question mark. And that was a larger report looking at permissive tax exemptions and statutory tax exemptions. The next stage in that epic saga of tax-based research is going to be splitting that report into two sections, looking at permissive tax exemptions and statutory tax exemptions. We've got all the numbers. We've done a lot of digging to find these numbers. And then each of those reports will be used for different lobbying purposes and advocacy work around trying to make sure that places that get tax exemptions actually are providing a public benefit. As, as Adriana mentioned, a lot of times we just the government gives tax exemptions to groups. It seems to indicate they support what they're doing. But some of those groups, for example, are overtly violating COVID regulations or inviting hate preachers into their place, so you know their place of worship, or engaging in a bunch of other discriminatory practices which are unacceptable and shouldn't be funded by tax dollars. So we're exploring that, and I'm really excited that we have a multifaceted approach to that. Um, and it's it's an ongoing project on taxes, and so look for that coming out quite soon. And the historical analysis on tax exemptions, I'm going to be nerding out about that. I think I mentioned this in a few talks, but yes, there was a tree in downtown Victoria that was tax exempt for a while, um, simply because people were praying underneath it. And um, yeah, good old uh, <laughs> gospel oak. Um, and we have the clergy residency exemptions, which, which Adriana mentioned, and we're always keeping a wary eye on tax issues. So if you notice anything that we should be aware of, do you know, kick it along to uh, the research team where we always like getting ideas from our members because it, help, it helps inspire our projects. The next big area has been crisis pregnancy centers. So I wear a lot of hats in my life and I'm, I'm not working with the BC Humanists. I also run a campaign for free prescription contraception. And so I get to put sort of wear two hats at once because I, I connected us with uh, an organization called uh, ARC, Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada. And we basically have, have teamed up on this project looking at crisis pregnancy centers. These are places that 
if you've seen posters around town from say birthright in your, in your hometown, wherever you might be, they say, are you pregnant? Are you scared? We can help. Um, and they, they, they might be able to help, but very often they'll provide biased information that's designed to point people away from abortion services and to try to convince them not to have an abortion. And um, in some countries, like the United States and some instances in Canada, they've been very deceptive in their advertising. Um, they may even present themselves as operating a medical clinic when they are not a medical clinic. And we're currently investigating crisis pregnancy centers in British Columbia with our, with our partners at ARC. And what we've done is we've looked at every single one in the province, created a really detailed database. We have some amazing volunteers helping us out on this project as well. And the next step is we're doing a website evaluation. So Adriana and some of our, our amazing research team volunteers are scouring the websites of these organizations to look at what, how they present issues, how they communicate issues. And then we'll be working on a larger report with ARC, looking at crisis pregnancy centers across the country. And the reason why this is kind of within the ballywick of uh, the BCHA is because, and this will probably come as no surprise to folks, but crisis pregnancy centers are disproportionately, if not all, religiously based. And they have lots of close ties with anti-abortion groups and, and religious lobbies. And so there's this interesting aspect where you have maybe not false information, but perhaps incorrect information being used to manipulate people in vulnerable situations to try to, to point them away from abortion. And it is, is, is the more I look into it, the more horrifying it is. Uh, we spent some time looking over the websites and you've got weird website loops that claim to have information on post-abortion syndrome, which is not a thing. And they're very deceptive. So we, we've, it's been very eye-opening for me and, and our team has been learning a lot and we have really robust data. The next step in that project is looking at maternity homes. And this is something that was new to me as well. Um, I don't know if folks have ever heard of these, but a term you may have heard from, from the past would be homes for unwed mothers. Um, this idea that, that people who, you know, young women who were in trouble, again, I'm using air quotes if you're just listening along here, um, would be sent away for a certain number of months and then they would come back um, and then the child would be put up for adoption. And there are horror stories of, of people being coerced into giving up children for adoption and, and, and various other um, not very pleasant stories to hear. And so in conjunction with our crisis pregnancy center work, we're looking at those. Um, and so expect some work on that in the near future because it, we're, we're currently digging up that information and working with some partners, those reports won't be out very soon, but hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have some, some more information on that and some reports to share with you. And it's also going to be a nationwide effort with our, our, our allies and, and partners with ARC. So it's kind of a, a bigger project. Okay, so a couple other things. Um, the, we've been working on an invocation guide. So as I mentioned, we get feedback from our members and that helps drive a lot of our research. And um, it keeps, uh, keeps us quite busy. So if you have ideas and things, let us know. A couple of members reached out to us saying, look, we would love some help making secular invocations. And then when we were writing our report on prayer in the BC legislature, similarly, we proposed a bunch of invocations, secular invocations they could read instead of their religious content. It was hard to write. I spent, well, we didn't have much time to write the report, but I spent a good enough amount of time writing these, these invocations and it was a challenge. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna be working on producing a book or a booklet that's gonna help people give secular invocations when they're needed. So, you know, yes, there are times to give speeches, graduation, marriage, deaths, births, uh, you know, publishing a book, whatever, roasts. And when you go through the massive pile of books of quotes that tend to float around out there, tons of them are, first of all, horribly sexist, because um, apparently all great men who have said great things just have very sexist opinions, but a lot of them are also deeply religious. And so the goal behind our invocation guide is gonna be to help people how to give an invocation, how to speak at an event, um, and, and critically how to you know, produce, um, how, how to just use quotes um, and how to you know, make invocations in a meaningful way. So look for that coming out soon. The way that you can help us is um, we are looking for quotes. I've been, as I said, I've been flipping through these sort of colossal books of citations and quotes. Um, what we would like you to do, and Ian's going to pop a, a link in the chat here, is if you have a quote or hundreds of quotes, we'll help you type them up, by the way, inspirational quotes for all occasions that are secular and ideally from, from secular folks. We'd love more quotes from people who aren't old white men. Um, that would be fantastic, by the way. There's far too many of those. Um, please enter them in the form. 
because the idea is we're going to compile those into a book that'll help people give invocations at weddings or funerals or various other events that are secular and, and follow humanist principles, but also, you know, inspirational. So a um, couple more items and uh, thank you for, for bearing with me. As you can see, it's been a very, uh, very busy time with our, uh, our research team. We've been doing a lot of spot research. So issues come up, are, we will identify something and we'll do a deep dive into it. That's actually partly how the clergy residency exemption project started. It started off as a blog post and uh, Adrian did such amazing work on it. We decided this is actually a bigger report. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of places of worship that have been violating COVID regulations. We've been monitoring those. Um, Ian recently put out a post on some groups that are sort of using this support group loophole that, uh, you know, it's not a religious gathering, it's a support group, but we're doing a religious gathering. We've been keeping an eye on that. Uh, we looked at the, recently looked at the National Prayer Breakfast. Um, and one of my favorite sort of random points was, so we had all the data on the birthdays of BC MLAs as part of our, our age analysis for our House of Prayer study. So some of you may have seen our April 1st report, which was a very serious look at how um, star signs impact BC politics. That was our uh, separation of religion and government in retrograde. If you haven't checked that out, I must say I had a lot of fun with it. And I know this is an audience that will appreciate sardonic, witty, and um, asinine footnotes. So uh, do, do read the report for footnotes. And I will promise you this. We have made predictions. We have printed and published those predictions online. And I promise you that in the future, a significant percentage or a smaller percentage of those will come true. And we will brag about it next April. So um, stand by for that. Uh, do read through it all. We had a lot of fun. There are graphs. It is not, it is not a two-page joke report The Onion puts out. It is a 36-page report with graphs and tables. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of fun. And so again, last two issues. These are ones that um, we've had uh, other researchers really take the lead on, so I won't speak to them that much. But we had uh, a larger report, which we submitted to the, the federal government on medical assistance in dying. And I was really proud to have got that work done. Um, I won't speak to it directly because I think other folks have, have done a much better job and can probably explain it better than I can. But I was really proud to be part of that process and actually had a friend take advantage of medical assistance in dying last week. And it was really eye-opening to see that experience go through. Um, and we, we are also just in the process of finishing edits on a report on conversion therapy, again, to submit that to the federal government to offer our, our two bits on um, a humanist perspective on banning conversion therapy. So that's, that's a rundown of our research uh, that we've been doing. It's been very busy. Some of those are our future reports. Some of those are our reports that you can find on our website. We've also been liaising with a lot of groups around the country. Um, I don't think Ian really sort of highlighted this as much as he could have, but the BCHA, from what I can tell, is we're one of the premier humanist organizations in the country. And one of the things we've been trying to do is sort of help bolster our friends in other provinces. I know it's been tough times. I have, I'm from Alberta and I know things are not looking good over in Alberta. And as a result, we've been reaching out to groups or they've been reaching out to us and we've been trying to sort of help them out. And part of that work around our municipal prayer project is gonna be giving our friends and allies around the country really good research they can use to, to beat people about the head with until they see reason, um, if for lack of a better expression. And that can really help out groups that don't have the capacity to do the kind of research that we're, we're churning out. Um, and we're doing conferences. So as Ian mentioned, um, and there's, there'll be another link in the, in the chat momentarily, um, we actually don't just, we aren't just presenting at a conference, we have an entire panel all to ourselves, exclusively looking at legislative prayer coming up at the uh, secular, the uh, secularism and non-religion conference towards the end of the uh, middle of the month. Uh, so come out to that. It's going to be a great panel. We quite literally had enough content to fill just a panel on just legislative prayer. <laughs> and uh, I would have liked to do one on taxes, but we'll have to wait for next year to do that one. And just uh, some future projects that we're working on very briefly to wrap up. Um, as I mentioned, we're still looking at legislative prayer in lots of different facets. Tax work is, we have lots of different um, threads going through our tax work. There's the crisis pregnancy center and maternity home research, conversion therapy. Um, I'm gonna start a small side project on sumptuary law. That's the law around dress codes because I, I can't resist. Uh, we have our invocation guide. And lastly, um, I, can, I can sort of formally announce this, but we are putting together an edited book. So because we've been churning out so much research and because there's a paucity of research in the rest of the country on secular politics, um, we are going to be, the BCHA is going to be uh, leading the way to do an edited academic book on secular politics in Canada. And the idea there is we're going to be soliciting contributions from academics around the country who explore secular politics in any aspect and uh, putting that together in an edited volume. So we'll shortly be circulating a uh, book proposal for people to look at. If any of you are 
of an academic uh, inclination, uh, do take a look at that. And we'd love to see some of your research and work. And um, I think this is sort of an important step as it kind of culminate, sort of a culmination of our last few years of, of research. And I think it's something that's necessary to really kind of introduce secular issues into you know, the more academic study in Canada. Not that there aren't scholars who are looking at that, but uh, it'd be great to get more voices together. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up there, but I guess the main point here I would say is for those of you who are supporting the BCH and I know you all are, uh, we are doing great work, a lot of work. It's keeping us very busy. And I hope you're, you can see some of the impact that we've had. And uh, we have ambitious uh, plans for helping change the world and make it a better, more secular place uh, moving forward. So yeah, thank you so much. I think Ian can put a donation link in the chat here too. <laughs> but no, uh, I do too much uh, other politics. But no, we really appreciate your guys' help. And uh, again, if you have any pressing issues you want to raise to our attention, send it our way. We'd love to uh, hear from you. Um, so with that, um, I guess uh, maybe folks have had a chance to uh, think of any questions for Adriana or myself. I'm happy to answer questions about our projects. I will try to keep the answers short. Um, if any of you have seen our reports, that is uh, something I struggle with, but uh, we will uh, be happy to take any questions.